For those of you I don't know, I'm Linda Longmire. I'm the uh, professor of global studies in the global studies and geography department, but also longtime member and co-director of the International Scene Series. So we're so glad that you're all here. We know some of it is under duress as classes, uh, uh, as we try to bring our classes to share these uh, experiences. But we're really delighted today um, to have um, a returning speaker who you will hear um, much about. But first and foremost, a little bit about the format. Um, our guest, Peter Beinart, will speak for about 20 minutes or so or more, we have some time. Uh, and then uh, we will have some comments and some questions from, from our own wonderful professor in the political science department, Stephanie Nannis, whose expertise is in Middle East politics. Uh, and then we will open things up again for thoughtful, reflective, respectful discussion and, uh, and your questions, again, prioritizing students. So, um, so let me then turn things over to uh, to Stephanie, to Professor Nannis, and um, for our for our discussion. And we're really delighted. Peter Beinert's been here before, and we always appreciate his insights. And um, Stephanie, Dr. Nannis will tell you a little bit more about him. <laughs> Take it away. Is this okay? Great, this is on. Um, so, indeed, we are very pleased to welcome Peter Barnard, Beinart. <laughs> Either is fine. Okay. Uh, to Hofstra today. Uh, a former Rhodes Scholar, Mr. Baynard teaches national reporting and opinion writing at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism and political science in the political science department at the CUNY Graduate Center. He is editor at large for Jewish Currents, a regular political commentator on MSNBC, and a fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. He has written several books, the most recent of which is called The Crisis of Zionism. He also writes The Beinart Notebook on Substack. So if you're interested, you can subscribe there. <coughs> he has become notable as the most prominent, if not the most, then a very, very prominent um, American Jewish critic of Israel and Israeli policy. Mr. Beinart occupies a small space in that um, identity. He is an observant Jew who studies Talmud every morning for an hour and sends his son to a Jewish day school, but also has publicly proclaimed his support for a single democratic state in Israel-Palestine, as well as support for a Palestinian right of return for Palestinian refugees, saying, quote, if Palestinians have no right to return to their homeland, then neither do we. He recently wrote in the New York Times about a growing contradiction for American Jews in their relationship to Israel as an increasingly stark choice between Jewish supremacy in Israel and commitment to democratic equality here in America. This division is particularly stark between older and younger generations of American Jews, with older generations firmly committed to Israel at all costs and a younger generation that increasingly, but not entirely, um, in growing numbers is choosing to su support, advocate on behalf of democratic equality and progressive political activism here in the United States. So I hope that's enough to get us started. <laughs> As uh, Professor Longmire said, Mr. Baynard will speak for 20, 25 minutes. We decided I'm going to ask one question, <laughs> one prompting question, um, and then we're gonna open it to the floor um, with a strong preference uh, for Hofstra students. Um, well, thank you very much for having me, um, and I, I want to particularly thank the people in the audience who are not going to agree with me. Um, uh, if you're the person in the room who disagrees with me the most strongly, you're the person I'm most grateful is here. I think one of the problems in the debate about Israel-Palestine, but also in many other American debates, is people generally only listen to those with whom they agree. So if you're one of the people who actually is doing, who's not doing that, I think you are kind of offering a model for all of us. It says in Pirkei Avot in the Mishnah, who is wise, the one who learns from all people. So it seems to me the people who are willing to travel the furthest ideologically to listen to views they disagree with are the ones actually who are showing the greatest wisdom. Um, there's so much we could talk about, and I'm happy to answer questions really on anything related to all of this, but maybe I'll start by talking a little bit about Gaza, since um, Gaza thi is where this war is, is taking place mostly now. Um, the, I think the most important thing to understand about the Gaza Strip 
is that most of the people in the Gaza Strip are not from the Gaza Strip. Most of them are from the families of refugees that were expelled from Israel I during Israel's creation between 1947 and 1949. Now, I, not all of the people uh, who fled Israel in, the, in war, Israel's War of Independence were expelled. Some fled in fear, but even according to Israel's own, the documents of the Haganah and even Israeli, Israel's own, even Israeli, is, most of Israel's own historians, most were expelled. The Gaza, so the, among Palestinian populations, the Gaza Strip is distinguished by having a very, very high percentage of refugee families, maybe around 70% or so. What happened is that they fled behind Egyptian lines when Egypt was fighting Israel during Israel's War of Independence. And then they the Gaza Strip was this area carved out basically behind the Egyptian army, and Egypt controlled it from 1948 until 1967, at which point Israel conquered the Gaza Strip along with some other territories, and, uh, and Israel has essentially in one form or another been controlling Gaza ever since. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why I still think that Israel actually still controls Gaza, uh, even after what was called the disengagement in 2007. But let me, get, let me do a little history before I get there. I saw someone shaking their head, so I, I want to make sure I, I'm, I'm taking account of, um, of, of other people's opinions uh, and responding to them. Um, Israel has had a problem with the population in Gaza since really the very beginning long before Hamas was created. Hamas, I'll get to Hamas, but Hamas was only created in 1987. But since the early 1950s, Israel's problem with Gaza, essentially, is that all those people don't want to be in Gaza because they are people who were expelled, some of them fled, most of them expelled, from the lands in what's now Israel. And in fact, another thing that's distinctive about Gaza is many of the people in Gaza are very close to the lands from which they were expelled. Some can actually see the lands from which they are expelled in southern Israel. So since from, the very, from very soon after Israel's creation, people in Gaza were trying to leave Gaza and go back to those territories, right, um, which Israel saw as a threat. So since the early 1950s, Israel has been making military incursions into Gaza primarily because of the threat that this population doesn't want to stay in Gaza, it wants to go back to Israel. Now, why is it a problem for that population to go back to Israel? The, the, the fundamental problem with Palestinians from Gaza or anywhere else going back into Israel is that at the core of the idea of Israel being a Jewish state is that Jews have a very large demographic majority. It's only really a Jewish state if Jews are running things, and Jews can only run things if they're a large demographic majority, right? And so if a lot of Palestinians return, or more than half of the Palestinian population was expelled during the war, war of Independence, Israel could not have existed as a Jewish state without this at large expulsion of Palestinians, because that was the only way you could have a large Jewish majority. And so Palestinians returning has always been a threat to Israel's Jewish character. So this has been at the core of the conflict between Israel and Gaza, literally since, virtually since Israel's founding. Now, again, Gaza was under Egyptian control. Um, then in 1967, Israel conquered it along with the West Bank and also East Jerusalem and the Sinai and the Golan Heights, some other places that we won't talk about. Um, and then Israel occupied the Gaza Strip along with the West Bank. Um, and what it, when, by occupy, what it means is that Israel had control over those territories, but it didn't give the Palestinians that it took control over citizenship in Israel. Right? Because if Israel gave them citizenship and the right to vote, remember, Israel then would have the same problem that I was talking about a minute ago, which would have all these Palestinians, and it would lose its large Jewish majority, right? which would threaten the basis of the Jewish state. So once Israel took this territory in Gaza, along with also the West, the West Bank, it, basically, it said, we're going to hold these people under military law. They'll be under our control, but they won't be able to vote for our government. They won't be citizens of our country. right? Now, as you might imagine, that's not a great situation to be in, to be under the control of a country where you can't vote for the government and you can't become a citizen. It means that that government is not accountable to you, right? which means it's not likely to have your interests at heart. Um, and so Palestinians in Gaza had another reason to be frustrated with Israel. First of all, they were frustrated because they had been expelled into this area. It's a very overcrowded area, in part because so many people were expelled there. And secondly, because it's under the control of a government that is not accountable to them because you're not citizens and you don't have the right to vote. 
Israel always felt that the West Bank, which was the other area it controlled, was more important to it than Gaza. The West Bank has more significance biblically for, for Jews than Gaza does. Uh, it's a larger area. And so all Israel built settlements in the West Bank and Gaza. Settlements means J Israeli Jews who moved into these territories. The Israeli Jews who moved there retained their citizenship. They could still vote, but their Palestinian neighbors didn't have those rights. But in 2005, Israel the Israeli prime minister then decided, you know what, these settlements in Gaza are really a pain in the neck. We're committed to our presence in the West Bank, which is much more important to us, but protecting all of these small number of settlers in Gaza with this huge Palestinian population is really a burden for us, and we're going to withdraw our settlements. So that's why, uh, when Israel did, what did that withdrawal, it's called the disengagement in 2005, a lot of people at that point said, well, Israel no longer controls Gaza, right? Because it doesn't have settlers there. Um, but I would argue that Israel never relinquished its control of the Gaza Strip. It just changed the nature of its control. Because although it withdrew its settlers and it no longer had soldiers on the ground, it was still controlling access in and out of the Gaza Strip. So Israel still maintained control over Gaza's airspace and its coastline, and four of the five land entrance points into Gaza also controlled by Israel, one controlled by Egypt. Even in the one controlled by Egypt, Israel has some influence. But basically, Israel virtually controls all access to Gaza by air, land, and sea. So even though Israel didn't have any of its own soldiers or its citizens there, it still controlled it from the outside. It's like imagine a prison. Right? And so the prison guards leave the prison, but you have p guards around the perimeter of the prison, right? and they can control whether you can go in and out, and they can control whether any goods can go in or out. That is still essentially a prison, right? because you don't have the ability to come in and out. You don't have the ability to have goods and services go in and out. That's the situation that Gaza has been under since Israel disengaged in 2005. Let me say something about, about Hamas, which is probably an organization you've heard a lot about. Um, Hamas comes out of a larger movement in the Arab world, uh, in, in the Middle East, called the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a movement of an Islamist movement, which basically means it wants, go it wants governance according to the principles of Islam. What exactly that means in principle, in, pro in, in practice, is not totally clear, partly because there haven't been a, a lot of opportunities for these Muslim Brother Partyhood parties to actually rule. But Hamas was the Palestinian wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Palestinian national movement, right, so the Palestinians had been fighting against Israel, fighting against the Zionist movement, fighting against Israel, had been led primarily by more secular lead uh, movements, nationalist movements, even like left-wing and communist movements. But in the late 1980s, the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood creates this organization called Hamas. Um, and initially, strangely enough, Israel thinks that Hamas is going to be more moderate than the other Palestinian factions. And Israel is actually quite s somewhat supportive of Hamas in its very early days, in the late 1980s. But then, in the l then a shift takes place. And basically what happens is that in, 19, in 1988, the Palestinian Authority, which is the more secular main Palestinian group, it recognizes Israel. It says, you know what? We're not going to try to destroy Israel anymore. We're going to recognize Israel, and we're going to hope that there will be a two-state solution in which Israel will exist here, and in the West Bank and Gaza, we will have our own state. And they start something called the Oslo process, which are negotiations that the Palestinians hope are going to lead to their having a state. Hamas starts to be critical of that. They say to their Palestinian rivals, you know, you guys are suckers because you're not going to get a state. You recognized Israel. You gave away our best card, and you haven't gotten a promise of a state. And in fact, you haven't even gotten Israel to stop the settlement growth in the West Bank that's moving us further and further away from a state. So Hamas takes this harder line position basically saying the other guys are sellouts. And it also, even though the, P the PLO, the mainstream group, has kind of largely stopped its violent resistance against Israel, Hamas, continu Hamas continues and actually ramps up 
that violent resistance against Israel, including, tragically and wrongly, against Israeli civilians. So Hamas is involved in blowing up buses of Israeli civilians, including of a friend of mine, um, in the mid-1990s. Um, and Hamas is taking this kind of hardline militant position. And then after Israel withdraws its soldiers and settlers, so I know this is a lot, uh, after Israel withdraws its soldiers and, and, and settlers in 2005, the Palestinians have an election. Um, and um, the George W. Bush administration at this point is really big into elections. They think the answer to the problems of the Middle East is democracy and more elections, right? But the problem is that they haven't thought that much about what happens if the people they don't like win, right? Which is always a challenge with elections. You can't be totally sure who's going to win, right? Um, and the, and, and, and this, this other party, the mainstream party, the party that had accepted Israel, which was called Fatah, or sometimes referred to as the, uh, we'll just, uh, the, referred to by the umbrella name, the PLO, They've been in power since 1996, running these Palestinian areas, waiting for them, they hope, to get a state. And in 2006, they have an election. And it turns out that Palestinians aren't very happy with this mainstream Palestinian party, Fatah, the PLO. They think it's corrupt, which it is. They think it hasn't done a good job of maintaining law and order. And they think it hasn't gotten them their state, right? So the Palestinians have this vote for the parliament. The, par the vote is in Gaza and the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, all of the areas that the Palestinians hope is going to be their country. And the Fa Fatah tells the Bush administration, don't worry, we got this, we're going to win. The Bush administration says those guys are going to win, and they lose, and Hamas wins. And everybody is really, really freaked out, right? Because they hadn't really counted on that possibility. Um, the polling data showed that the main two reasons that people voted for Hamas were first of all because they thought that, the PA, that, that Fatah was corrupt, and secondly because it wasn't maintaining law and order. So basically they voted for the other guys. The, the, the Hamas had been running these schools, these hospitals, they had this kind of reputation for like doing social services, maybe not being so corrupt. A friend of mine who come from Gaza told me that during the election, one of the Hamas leaders would drive around in this really beat up old car and basically say, you see what kind of cars those guys are driving versus the car that I'm driving? You see, I'm not on the take, I'm not corrupt. Um, anyway, Hamas won the election. And so the US uh, was in a bit of a quandary. Um, because it would have had to allow Hamas to govern alongside the Palestinian Authority, but Hamas hadn't accepted Israel's existence. It wasn't part of this peace process. So instead, what they did was they said to the Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, disband parliament. All of a sudden, their interest in democracy seemed to wane a little bit. Um, they said, disband the parliament, rule by emergency decree, and they worked with some countries in the Gulf to basically get a bunch of arms to try to go into Gaza in particular, where Hamas had a bit of a stronghold, and expel Hamas from Gaza. But that backfired as well, because Hamas turned out to be stronger on the ground, and it won this little battle they had for Gaza. And ever since, Hamas has been on the, in charge in Gaza. But it's kind of in charge in Gaza like a prison gang would be in charge in Gaza. Remember my analogy, because Israel's controlling everything from the outside, like the prison guards on the outside, and Hamas is like the prison gang on the inside, right? So, and, and, and Hamas has been building up, Hamas has been building up weapons, and sometimes they launch these rockets at Israel. Israel launches uh, much, more, much more powerful weapons back at Gaza, and Gaza remains under a blockade. And being under blockade is really, lousy place, la lousy situation for the people, right? It means basically it's really, really difficult to come and go. Um, the, uh, uh, it's, it, the very little can come in. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's very difficult to kind of build any infrastructure or an economy if you don't have easy access for goods coming in and out. Israel says, well, we can't allow people and goods to come in and out of Gaza because they could use that to attack us or they could use that to bring in weapons. But the consequence for the people of Gaza is that Gaza has extraordinarily high levels of unemployment, very low rates of uh, clean water and electricity. Um, the UN actually said in 2017 that Gaza was not really a livable place to live anymore. Um, um, uh, um, uh, I talk, a friend, another friend who I knew who grew up in Gaza said that life in Gaza was so depressing because there was no prospect of really like, have, like having a career and being able to like actually really make a living or have much hope in your life that he said that everyone he grew up with in Gaza had contemplated suicide. 
even though suicide is, is, as he explained it to me, really a grave sin in Islam. Um, a an Israeli journalist named Amir Haas told me that the conditions in Gaza were so grim, again, it's a very small area, basically people locked in there for their whole lives, that she knew a young woman who got cancer. And if you got cancer, that can be one, you know, a very certain kinds of diseases, then Israel will allow you to leave the Gaza Strip to go get treatment somewhere else. So she was allowed to go to the West Bank to get treatment for her cancer. And Amira told me that, uh, that this um, young woman, that all of her siblings and her, and her cousins were envious of her um, because she had, had a, she had been able to leave the Gaza Strip. So this was the kind of grim conditions um, that, that Gaza was in. Um, Israel thought that it had... How much time how much am I going on for? I don't want to... Keep uh, going for too long. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So I'll go maybe just like five yeah, minutes longer. Oh yeah, I think I. Um, so maybe I'll just do a few more minutes, uh, just to the background. I haven't even gotten to October seventh yet. Um, um, so, um, so this is the situation of Gaza. Israel thinks it's kind of somewhat under control. There have been these. There occasionally there's some rocket fire, but Israel feels like they kind of have the situation kind of under control. But Hamas actually is planning this huge attack. Um, which it carries out on October 7th and kills roughly 1,200 Israelis. Some of them are soldiers. Many of them are civilians, right? They go, it goes house to house and kills people in what are called these kibbutzim, these Jewish communities that are in the south of Gaza. And, um, um, and they also take hundreds of hostages. Um, uh, it's a very, very brutal attack, um, a va an attack that violates, in my mind, the rules of war, which say that you don't have the right to target civilians. And so Israel responds with its own attack on Gaza, and that attack is still going on. One of the things that Israel does is it cuts off fuel to Gaza. Remember, Israel had control of everything going into Gaza. So it cuts off fuel to Gaza, so there's no fuel, so, Gaza meet, so there's no electricity in Gaza. Um, and also Israel very, very tightly controlled. Israel was already pretty tightly con controlling what happens into Gaza, but now it, ma it, it makes that control much, much, much tighter, which means that the amount of food going into Gaza goes way down. And so we see now the emergence of a famine. Um, what Alex DeWall at Tufts has said actually, essentially the, the largest man-made famine since World War II. Um, um, uh, in Gaza, many, many people are going without food, e maybe, if the, maybe eating one meal a day. The reports that people are eating grass and leaves and making, making uh, bread from animal feed. Um, and there's also been roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 people in Gaza killed by Israel's airstrikes. Now, some people will say those numbers aren't reliable because they are reported through the, the Gaza Health Ministry. Um, but in fact, if you look at the previous rounds of Israel's fighting in Gaza, you actually see that the numbers that come out of the G Gaza's health ministry line up quite closely with the UN's numbers, with the United States, with the State Department's numbers, with international human rights organizations' numbers, and indeed actually even with Israel's numbers. If you go back and look at previous rounds, they've proved to be pretty reliable. In fact, many people think they may be, numbers may be quite higher because the numbers that are reported are only the people who get to a morgue, whereas there are a significant number of people who are actually still lying under the rubble. Because remember, when buildings come down in Gaza, they ha don't have bulldozers and things to get people out of the rubble. They're literally trying to dig people out with their bare hands. Um, there's reports that somewhere in the neighborhood of, um, that, uh, um, that there are, there because the Gazan hospitals, many of them have been destroyed, um, that there have been large, do do doctors have been having to operate without anesthesia. Um, there have been, there, there are, according to reports, 10 to 15 amputations per day. Um, it's a very, very grim situation. The, the Washington Post recently reported that there are so many children in Gaza now who have been killed and their entire families have been killed that they've had to come up with a new acronym to describe this situation, which they call wounded child, no living family. Um, um, now Israel's response answer would be, we had no choice to do this. Hamas doesn't accept our existence. Hamas has been attacking us, including this horrifying attack against civilians. What choice did we have? What other country would basically allow an attack of this scale? Remember, Israel's a small country, so 1,200 people is like, a by, if you compare it to America's size, it's much, much bigger than what happened on September 11th. So they would say, what choice did we have? What would any other country do? And I emotionally understand that argument. I, I emotionally can sympathize with that argument. I, I 
we have the names of all of the hostages on the refrigerator of, of our door. There are several of them that in our, in our synagogue, we pray for them for uh, every, every week. I personally pray for particular hostages every day. They are very much in our thoughts. And, 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 and I know people whose family members have been taken hostage, people who are fighting in Gaza. The reason I, I don't agree that Israel's response is wise, the reason I don't believe it's actually going to make Israel safer, is that it's, under, it's ignoring the fundamental underlying problem here, which isn't a military problem. Gaza is not a separate country like Mexico or Canada that just attacked. Remember my analogy of a prison. It's a population of people who are imprisoned. Human Rights Watch calls Gaza an open-air prison. It's prisoners who were expelled from their lands and want to return. Those people have very, very profound, deep grievances against Israel. And they had them long before Hamas was created, and they will have them long after Hamas ceases to exist. So even if you could destroy Hamas, which most people think you probably can't do, there's no reason to think that Palestinians would stop fighting against Israel. In fact, we know that Hamas recruits its fighters from the families of people that Israel has killed. So even if Hamas were to cease to exist, now given this 30,000 people killed, I think I saw a report of 1,700 orphans. Um, um, given that number of people, almost everyone in Gaza has had family killed, seeing family literally starving to death in front of their eyes. Even if Hamas weren't to exist, do you think that's a climate in which you're going to have p Palestinians who want to get, to get, al get along with you, who are gonna be more moderate? It seems to me that Israel is creating the conditions through this destruction in Gaza of more hatred and more desire for revenge, and it's not dealing with the underlying problem. The underlying problem is that human beings need to be free, and they will fight to be free. And if you're living in a cage, and you're living under the control of a government for which you can't vote, and you can't be a citizen, um, you're going to fight for your freedom. Now, the way Hamas did it on October 7th was horrifying and immoral. I'm fundamentally opposed to targeting civilians, period, no matter what circumstances you face. But I think if you are one of those people like I am that believe that the situation of Palestinians in Gaza and indeed Palestinians in the West Bank and more generally is unjust, that it's unjust to deny people basic rights, Remember, if you live in a, think about, compare the situation of Palestinians to the situation of black Americans in the South. Black Americans in the South didn't have the right to vote, but they were under Jim Crow and segregation. They were at least citizens of the United States. Palestinians are living under Israeli control without even being citizens of the country in which they have lived their entire lives. If you live under the control of a state that is not accountable to you, which you don't have citizenship, where you can't vote, that state is going to be really, really brutal to you. Um, and so it seems to me if you oppose what Hamas did on October 7th, as I do, it's important to ask yourself, what kind of Palestinian struggle for freedom would you support? Palestinians have tried boycotts. They've tried going to the, interna to the United Nations. They've tried going to the International Criminal Court. They've tried hunger strikes. They've, they tried in 2018 something called the Great March of Return, where they march mostly, though not entirely, mostly nonviolently towards the, 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 the perimeter between Gaza and Israel. And it seems to me if you oppose what Hamas did, but you recognize there's something fundamentally wrong about denying people their freedom, you have to f answer the question of what kind of struggle for freedom you'll be willing to support. And if you don't support anything, if your opposition, if you basically oppose any Palestinian resistance aimed at gaining freedom, then I actually think you make it more likely, tragically, that we will see more of these kind of violent attacks that we saw on October 7th. So there's lots more beyond that that we could talk about, but I'll just stop there. not really sure how to follow up on mm. that. <laughs> um, you, you know, I think that I think there'll be a lot of questions about uh, Gaza and Israeli policy, mm. um, but I'm, I'm going to open up a, a main conversation that yeah. I'm sure you've also addressed, mm. um, which is about, again, I'm kind of stuck with the American Jews. Sure, so, sure, sure, but sure. Yes, yeah, yeah. we should still talk about Gaza, um, but I'm going to open up another conversation yeah. that um, um, sort of 
sort of, and, and it's not just critique, like mm. most people can accept, like, oh, I'm s I'm, is this on? Maybe I'm not close enough? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't like my amplified voice very much. So, okay. Um, so, um, about anti-Semitism on campus, mm. uh, rise in anti-Semitism, generally speaking, um, but also specifically the claim um, most people can make a distinction mm. between criticism of Israeli policy right. and anti-Semitism, or at least they say they can. Right. Okay, um, but the idea and uh, that that Israel should become, or Israel, the West Bank, Gaza Strip should become a single, secular, democratic state, right, right from the river to the sea, right. is inherently anti-Semitic. Right. Um, how, what, what do you make of that claim? Right. So I, I hope it's not anti-Semitic because that would make me an anti-Semite. Um, um, uh, I don't think that I think there's something perverse about saying that it's bigoted to argue that people should live equally under the same law, irrespective of their religion or ethnicity. That's the principle that we're fighting for with some difficulty in the United States, the idea of equality under the law, irrespective of your race, religion, uh, uh, gender. That's the, that's, the, that's the principle that I believe in the United States. I believe that principle all around the world. And I believe, in it, I believe it in Israel, Palestine as well. Um, now, people will say, doesn't Israel have the right to exist, right? Don't all countries have the right to exist? To which I would say, uh, there's no right to maintain a particular political system. If a political system is unjust, then it can be replaced by a more just political system, right? Um, uh, in South Africa, for instance, right? South Africa didn't cease to exist as a country, but its political system changed when it went from being a country based on white supremacy to a country where black people got the vote. In a very fundamental way, America's entire political system changed also first after the Civil War when we ended slavery, and then in the 1960s when we basically extended the vote to black Americans. America didn't cease to exist. We simply changed our political system in a way that made it more fair and more equal. And this is a position that America takes about for many countries around the world. There are many countries around the world, whether it's China or Russia or Iran or many other countries where we would like those countries to have a fundamentally different political system because we don't think their political system is just. Um, uh, right now, Israel is a state that is based, to use a provocative term, on Jewish supremacy, by which I mean Jews are legally supreme over Palestinians. As I just said, in the, in the West Bank, Jews who live in the West Bank are citizens. They have the right to vote. They live under civil law. They have free movement. Palestinians who live in the West Bank can't become citizens. They can't vote for the government that controls their lives. They live under a military court system with a 99% prosecution rate, and they need military permission to, to, to travel around. As I said, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are under Israeli blockade, under blockade from a government that they can't vote for. Even Palestinian citizens of Israel even though they can vote, they're sometimes called Arab Israelis, even though they can vote, they're not equal either. Uh, one, of the ways, one of the ways to understand that lack of equality inside of Israel proper, even among the minority of Palestinians who have citizenship, right? I mean, again, to use a rough analogy, you could think about like maybe the situation of black Americans in the first half of the 20th century, where most black Americans who were lived in the South didn't have the right to vote, and a minority of black Americans who lived in the North did have the right to vote, but still weren't equal citizens, right? The, way, the reason that Palestinians, one way to understand how, why Palestinians aren't equal citizens in Israel is to understand the way Israel distributes land. So 93% of the land inside Israel proper, is not the West Bank and Gaza, but the kind of original Israel, is state land. It's, it's, uh, the, um, it's controlled by an institution called the Israel Land Authority. Much of that land was actually taken from Palestinians when Palestinians were expelled in 1948. The Israel Land Authority basically gives that land in chunks to cities and towns to expand or to industrial areas or agricultural areas. It has 22 seats, the Israel Land Authority. 12 go to the Israeli cabinet, 10 go to something called the Jewish National Fund. The Jewish National Fund is an organization that develops land for the use of Jews. For the use of Jews, right? So think about the implication that has if you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel who's not Jewish, right? That's why there's been no majority Palestinian 
city or town built in Israel since 1948, and it's why Palestinian citizens, although they're 20% of the population, live on 2 or 3% of the land. It's why, according to the Israeli human rights group B'Tselem, 87% of the home demolitions in Israel proper were of Palestinian homes, because Palestinians live in these ghettos, essentially. They can't, they can't, they're very overcrowded. They can't expand, because the Israel Land Authority doesn't give Palestinians more land on which to grow. It's almost imagine if you were a Jewish or Muslim American, and 93% of the land in the United States was under the auspices of an institution that essentially operated for the use of Christians, right? You wouldn't feel like an equal citizen, right? So these are principles that uh, I understand at a very deep level why many American Jews and certainly many Israeli Jews and other Jews feel that Jewish supremacy is necessary for our safety, right? The feeling is we're a small people, we're a people that have suffered immensely over the centuries, um, uh, culminating in the Holocaust, and we need a state that we control. Only one state. We need to control it. Yes, maybe it's not great for the people who, the, non, the Palestinians who live alongside of us, but it's a big world. We need one little place that we have total control to be safe, right? I mean, I know this argument, believe me. I was raised with this argument. Uh, um, uh, rarely does a day go by that I do not hear this argument. Here's why I disagree. It's, here's why I have a minority view. When you impose supremacy and domination on another group of people, you are inflicting a tremendous amount of violence on them. It may not always be visible to you, again, in the same way that necessarily the violence that the United States, that America was inflicting on black Americans during Jim Crow wasn't always visible to white Americans, but there's a tremendous amount of violence that you inflict on people when you deny them their rights. And when you inflict a lot of violence on people, those people are likely, sooner or later, in some way or another, to fight back violently against you. And that puts you in danger. And that's why I believe if you look at political science literature from, very, from divided societies around the world, you find that those societies are safer for everybody when everybody is represented in government, and they are more s unsafe for everybody when one group is locked out of government and, the go and don't, doesn't have the ability to vote and, and equ advocate equally for their rights. In South Africa, white South Africans were absolutely convinced that if apartheid ended and their supremacy ended, they would be in grave danger because Nelson Mandela's organization, the African National Congress, contrary to popular belief, was not a nonviolent organization. It had a military wing that was carrying out armed attacks. And they thought, we will be at the mercy of these terrorists if we don't have a supremacist state. But you know what happened when black people got the vote in South Africa? Mkwantu Wisizwe, the ANC's military wing, disbanded. You know why? Because black people didn't need to pick up guns in South Africa to get the government to pay attention to them. They had the vote. In Northern Ireland, the Irish Republican Army was a violent organization. It carried out, uh, it, it blew, tried to blow up department stores in London. Protestants and people all over Britain were terrified of the Irish Republican Army. But you know what happened when Catholics got political equality in Ireland? The IRA put away its weapons. In fact, the IRA's political wing, Sinn Féin, is now in charge in Northern Ireland. And it's not a threat to Protestants. And the reason it's not a threat to Protestants is that the vast majority of people in any society, I believe, if they have the ability to petition their government nonviolently through the vote, their interest in using arms, armed resistance, goes way down. And so that's why a lot of people in my own community, my own shul, even my own family, think I'm a little bit of a lunatic. Um, I believe, actually, that Israeli Jews will be safer if Palestinians are equal and free than if Palestinians are on the, on the kind of subservient position they're in now. I think with that, we should open the floor to questions. Um, I think Professor Longmire was going to help me. I, I mean, people can come up to the mic. Um, I'm going to, first two questions are for students. First two questions for students. By all means, Hofstra student, go right ahead. Am I passing you the water? I'm sorry. Yeah. And do you want, do you want this now? Oh, okay. Sure. Why yeah. not? Thanks. Okay. Uh, you have is it working? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'm a, so as I'm an American Jew, I've grown up with all the Zionist beliefs. And one thing that's been, I am currently in a class about genocide. 
and we've been discussing at length about the genocide accusations at Israel. What do you think of that? Because there are some students of mine who, fellow students of mine who are adamantly believe there is genocide going on in Gaza. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Great. So um, I think that the, the term genocide is obviously a, a, very, a term that provokes very, very strong emotions. And I will say that I'm not an international lawyer, so I'm not really qualified to make an international to kind of a legal adjudication of whether this is genocide or not. Genocide is a very particular meaning. It doesn't mean you kill all the people. It really has a lot to do with intent. Is your intent to destroy the people in part or in or a part or is your intent to destroy all or part of the people, right? So that's complicated first to know what it means to be to be part or whole. It's secondly, the word destroy doesn't necessarily mean kill everybody. So for instance, in, in Xinjiang, in China, where there's this Uyghur population that's been terribly, terribly oppressed by China, the United States government has said that that constitutes genocide. But China has not killed all the Uyghurs. I don't even know if the Uyghur population has gone down. What essentially the China has done is put people in these internment camps prevented them from practicing their religion, often separated from their uh, brainwash, tried to kind of indoctrinate and brainwash them, separated from, their ch separated from their children, and essentially tried to destroy their culture, right? So the term genocide has a kind of broader set of meaning. What we can say is there, there are s international legal scholars, including actually Israeli-born international legal scholars, who think that what Israel has done does co constitute genocide. And get, you know, 90% um, of people have been displaced from their homes. Seventy percent of buildings have been damaged or destroyed. Um, I saw a recent figure from the United Nations which said that if the war ended tomorrow um, and Gaza went back to the, gro the economic growth rate that it had before this war, it would, Gaza would not return to the GDP level it had on October 7th until 2092. All of the universities have been either partially or totally destroyed. Most of the hospitals have been totally or, or damaged or destroyed. And since it's not likely that Israel is going to make the ease the blockade, but Israel will probably institute an even a tighter blockade, and Israel is also now increasing the buffer zones inside the Gaza Strip that are off limits to Palestinians, so Palestinians will have an even smaller area on which to live in a very overcrowded area. It seems to me this is going to be a catastrophically unlivable place. Um, does that constitute genocide? I don't know. The International Court of Justice, where they've, South Africa has brought this case, has said that it's plausible that it could be genocide, and on that basis, they're going to basically be investigating for probably years to come. So I hope that doesn't sound like a cop-out, but I don't think I have the capacity to say yes or no, but I think I can explain why there is a real debate among people who study genocide on this question. Hi, thank you for coming here. Um, so you uh, advocate for a single democratic secular yeah. state. Do you think after all the humiliation and indignity um, that you've talked about that the Palestinians go through and you know how this often can radicalize them, yeah. um, how do you think that sort of reconciliation is possible? You mentioned the ANC and um, I was thinking about the, the Truth and Reconciliation yeah. Commission, yeah. like the hearings they had after. Yeah. Yeah. Is something like that even feasible with all the violence that's taken place? Well, the there it's the another alternative, right? One which I myself supported for a long time until a few years ago was partition into two states, right? Um, and if uh, uh, and I don't think p partition is possible anymore because Israel's control over the West Bank is so deep at this point. You can go back to columns in the New York Times from the early 1980s saying that a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza would be impossible if Israel had 100,000 settlers in the West Bank. There are now 700,000 settlers in the West Bank. So I don't think partition is possible. Uh, I could be proven wrong. I would be perfectly happy to be proven wrong. Um, but. Given that I don't think that's likely, it seems to me the choices that we have are between the one state that exists now and one equal state. A potential, um, um, and it seems to me under those conditions, the question you want to ask is, which condition is likely to produce more or less hatred? It's true. Historic hatreds 
can last for a very, very long time, right? The process of reconciliation and moving towards e more equal justice, as we can see in South Africa, as we can see in our own country, is a very, very long and slow process, right? And it can often be one step forward, one step back, right? But it seems to me the beginning of wisdom is to recognize that if you want some kind of reconciliation, at least stop creating more and more hatred by brutalizing and killing people more and more, right? Um, and so, yes, I think that, that that process of reconciliation is a lot harder than it was before October 7th. Um, but it's interesting. If you look at Palestinian citizens of Israel, again, they're the only Palestinians under Israeli control who can vote and you look at how they vote, they vote for political parties. They don't vote for political parties that say, kick out all the Jews. They vote for political parties that believe in the principle of equality under the law. Um, and so we see that where Palestinians can express themselves the most politically, actually this is what Palestinians want. Thank you. Sir. Hi. So as I've uh, been, been researching and learning more about the recent uh, conflict in Gaza, I, I've noticed a lot of parallels uh, between what's going on there now and what happened uh, in the aftermath of 9-11. Of mm. Now, um, like a lot of people yeah. uh, increasingly feel uh, it is though 9-11 um, essentially was sort of used as a, a pretext mm. uh, for these, these two wars, occupations mm. in the Middle East. And mm. at the time, the uh, progressive... Uh, argument against uh, invading uh, Iraq and Afghanistan was that it would cause a shockwave of anti-American sentiment mm -hmm. within the Middle mm -hmm. East mm -hmm. and uh, destabilize mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the the entire region. Um, so uh, I guess my question is: um, Is uh, Israel's response uh, merely sort of using uh, this this massive terrorist attack as a pretext to do what they wanted to do? Anyway, and also, do you think that the outcome of this will be uh, essentially a, a massive wave of um, of anti-Israel sentiment or anti-Semitism mm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in that in that area? Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, so, I, I think that the. the there are some parallels between, I think, America's response after 9-11 and Israel's response after October 7th. Again, is for, for Israelis, October 7th was a more massive event than 9-11. Than, um, than it was more massive as a percentage of the population. It's also probably, it's also, you know, a more traumatized population given Jewish history. Um, uh, and, and I think, though, though, often when countries respond in a moment of fury, it doesn't often lend itself to the best long-term thinking, right? Um, and, that, and it doesn't often lend itself to an environment where people are very open to dissenting points of view and to people who say, wait a second here, maybe this isn't going to work out so well, right? And we learned this at great cost in the United States, right? That the U.S. was able to overthrow the Taliban and, uh, and Saddam Hussein. Um, but we weren't actually able to govern those countries or create new governments in those countries. We ended up in quagmires, right? Um, and we couldn't imagine that there could be anything worse than Saddam Hussein. We thought of, right? But in fact, we laid the groundwork in Iraq for ISIS. And Israel has had its own history with this. In the early 1980s, Israel went into southern Lebanon to kick out the PLO. And they did kick out the PLO, which they thought at that point was the worst thing they could imagine. And they laid the groundwork for Hezbollah, which is the group in southern Lebanon that fights them now. Um, so yes, I think Israel can depose Hamas. Israel's kind of already... De I mean, Hamas has fighters left, but I don't think they're going to be running Gaza anymore. Um, but Israel doesn't have an answer to who or what is going to be running Gaza. Because any group... If Israel stays there itself it will be facing an insurgency, right? And anyone that Israel tries to put in place there, whether it's the Palestinian Authority from the West Bank, which has zero credibility, or some other force, if there's any people kind of foolish enough to be wanting to go in on the ground in Gaza, they will become objects of an insurgency. And that insurgency will be extremely difficult to put down for the same reason it was in Iraq and Afghanistan, because you're fighting on someone else's home turf, right? And those people have a very serious grievance against you. So yes, I worry that this is not going to end well for Israel. It has produced a lot of anti-Israel sentiment in the Middle East. Now, most, the good news for Israel is that most of the governments in the Middle East are not democracies, and they don't really have to respond to their people, right? So they don't necessarily have to change their policy. Some of those governments in the Middle East actually have pretty good relationships with Israel for their own reasons, even though Israel is very unpopular among their people. And yes, 
there does seem to have been a rise in anti-Semitism. Um, we see we, that we have academic studies from the United States and from Belgium and from Australia, which all show that in periods of time where Israel has substantial military operations that kill a significant number of Palestinians, that there's a rise in reported anti-Semitic attacks. And so given that, it's really not surprising at all, though it's tragic, that we see a spike in anti-Semitism now because some people are not are essentially are taking out their anger against Israel against Jews, right? Some people actually, by the way, are also taking out their anger against Hamas, against Palestinians, right? There was a murder of a, a young Palestinian in Chicago, a, sh a, a, a shooting a sh in Vermont, and a shooting in Texas. So unfortunately, this is a part of a history in America where sometimes people get angry at a country overseas. We saw this with Chinese Amer Asian Americans during COVID. You get angry at a foreign government, and then you take it out on people who share an ethnicity or religion with a nationality with those people in the United States, which is fundamentally wrong. Um, but unfortunately, we're seeing some of that in the US. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hello. Uh, my question's based off of, do you know, I think his name's uh, Masad Yosef, the Green Prince, the son of a former co-founder. I know who he is. I don't know yeah. him personally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so basically, he says uh, the problem in Palestine is yeah. there's when they're young, they're basically groomed to hate Israel, hate mm -hmm. Jews, yeah. and they have a duty to die mm -hmm. for the land. So drone strikes, warnings, yeah. their deaths are used as propaganda or information war, yeah. either by Iran or whatever other yeah. groups want to use that. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on, like, the deaths are, it's they want it to happen. Yeah. So yeah. they could blame Israel, even if they get the right to vote. The surrounding countries, mm. Iran, Lebanon, they're they're not going to just leave things be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with their geopolitics. Right, right. So I don't know. I don't know this particular person, although I know who he is. Um, but I can only say from my own experience um, as someone who knows many, many Palestinians, I will say that almost all the Palestinians I know um, have tremendous hostility towards Israel. Um, um, and but when I t talk to them about why, I haven't met yet one who says that the reason for their anger at Israel is because they watched an anti-Israeli TV show or because they had an anti-Israel textbook or any of that stuff. What they all say is that their anger at Israel is for what Israel has done to their families, to what has happened to them. The fact their families were expelled in 1948, the fact that they live under military law, that their land has been taken, that they've seen family members jailed and killed. Um, so I think that the, the, the main reason for Palestinian hostility and anger against Israel is the things that Palestinian experience at Israel's hands, right? Um, there, uh, um, now, I mean, there have been um, studies of the Palestinian textbooks, for instance, alongside the Israeli textbooks. There was a study, a pretty big study done a bunch of years ago by a guy at Yale named Bruce Wexler, along with a, a Palestinian political science, a Palestinian professor of education, I think at Bir Zayt, and an Israeli professor at Tel Aviv University. And what they found actually was that both the Palestinian textbooks and the Israeli textbooks were pretty one-sided and tended to basically tell their own national narrative, but that the Palestinian textbooks were no more hateful in terms of their attitudes towards Jews than the Israeli textbooks were in their attitudes towards Palestinians. Um, so I think that this is a bit of an overblown narrative. In terms of Iran and, Iran and, and, and Lebanon, you know, Iran is using the Palestinian issue to try to gain influence in the Middle East. Iran is, an, is, a, is a Persian, not an Arab country, and it's a Shia country. So most of the population in the Arab world, in the Middle East, are Arab and Sunni. So Iran faces an, an obstacle in its efforts at regional influence, and it uses its support for the Palestinian cause as a way of giving, giving itself more leverage in the reason. But I think fundamentally, if Palestinians um, essentially end their conflict with Israel, then I think that takes a tremendous amount of the wind out of the sails of countries like Iran that are using the Palestinian cause as a way of trying to kind of inflate themselves regionally. So I, be, I think that the, US, the conflict between Israel and Iran would actually be significantly less dangerous if there was not a conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Thanks. You spoke about the degree to which um, the Palestinian Authority and Fatah yeah. and Abu Mazan have been totally discredited yes. in the electorate of yes. the West Bank. Yes. Um, 
just today, I think it was, um, they announced a new cabinet mm -hmm. um, for the Palestinian yeah. Authority to yeah. serve um, yeah. in the PNA. Do you think that there's any possibility of successful reform mm -hmm. in the Palestinian Authority? Do you think that yeah. they'll succeed in um, if if Hamas is removed in regaining uh, influence over the Gaza Strip? Yeah. And do you think that the Palestinian Authority will or perhaps ought to be replaced um, in the absence of a single secular yeah. democratic state in all of Israel and the occupied territories. Yeah, thank you. So just to make the terms clear, the Palestinian Authority is this thing that was created. Remember, I mentioned the Oslo Accords, the Oslo process. So that's after the, 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 the main Palestinian party, Fatah, recognized Israel. And they started to basically, and so then they said, OK, you can come in on the ground and create this kind of administrative structure, which might be the embryo of a state, and we'll, we'll have negotiations. And that was called the Palestinian Authority. Um, and now it used to run the West Bank and Gaza, um, and now it just rounds the West Bank. I mean, it runs it, it runs under areas his, A and B within the sorry? West Bank. It runs areas A and B within the West Bank. Yeah, I mean, in reality, it, it, in truth, Israel con actually Israel controls all of the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority is a kind of a subcontractor, right? Which is say the Israeli military can go into any square inch of the West Bank any day it wants and arrest anyone it wants, including the leaders of the Palestinian Authority. They need Israel's permission even to travel around to leave the Palestinian Authority. But it basically designates certain tasks that Israel doesn't want to do. Um, in the in uh, like you know running the schools and picking up the garbage and that kind of thing and areas A and B are where the Palestinian Authority has these functions and then area C of the West Bank is the 60 percent of the West Bank which is under direct Israeli control and the Palestinian Authority doesn't have any place at all anyway the problem is with the, for the Palestinian Authority is that it set out on this strategy, basically, certainly since 2005, that it was going to collaborate with Israel, it was going to work with Israel to try to keep things quiet in the West Bank in the hopes that it could reassure Israel to then give Palestinians a state. And it hasn't worked. Palestinians haven't gotten closer to a state. They've gotten further away as Israeli settlement growth has continued and continued. And Mahmoud Abbas, who's the leader, um, hasn't been willing to how hasn't held an election, right? Um, uh, uh, since um, again, since those elections that 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 Hamas won in 2006. Now, Hamas, Abbas doesn't want to hold an election because uh, he's afraid he would lose. Israel doesn't want them to hold an election because, it, because Abbas is more compliant and they're afraid that someone like Hamas or someone else who was more radical might win. And America doesn't want to hold an election for that same reason. So basically, nobody has an interest in holding. Uh, ha Hamas might be open to having an election, but none of the other people actually have an interest in holding election because they're afraid that actually th th it might undermine their control. Um, the problem is, though, if you have a political leadership in power for a long time and there are no elections, what's likely to happen, right? It's corrupt and authoritarian and it doesn't meet the people's needs. And the only way you can respond to that and get a more legitimate leadership is to hold elections, right? Um, so it seems to me that you need a process among Palestinians in which Palestinians can hold elections to hold, have a more legitimate leadership. I mean, America can basically try to impose somebody or say, put this leader in rather than Mahmoud Abbas, but that's not going to be a legitimate leadership because it's not chosen by Palestinians, right? So I think what you need to do is you need a process. Most of the most popular Palestinian leaders are in jail. The Israel has jailed a vast number of Palestinians over the years, and most of the most popular Palestinian leaders are in jail. So I think you, what, a, a, you need a process where you would let some of those people out of jail, and you would allow them, you then you would have a process by which you could have some kind of political process on elections in which you could actually have a legitimate Palestinian leadership that then Israel could, that could lay out its vision for the Palestinians. If you don't do that, you're going to have a, a leadership that has no credibility among its people. Hi, Professor Nanes. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was just wondering how the logistics of a one-state solution would work, yeah. mainly in terms of immigration, immigration from other Jewish populations, yeah. Palestinians mm. returning, as right. well as something as simple as country name. Yeah. I just feel like there's a lot of moving pieces to this, and I wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, some people have tried to think this through a bit. Again, uh, what I'm talking about is not is quite remote from the reality that we are today. But I think, you know, in 1954, 
uh, the uh, in the in the darkest days of apartheid, the African National mm -hmm. Congress and its allies laid out something called the Freedom Charter, which was a different vision. Right? It took it took almost you know it took forty years before that came to be. But so, uh, in terms of the, I, the what is different about Israel Palestine from South Africa is that it's a binational country. It's a population with two national identities, and so it seems to me that you need to. It, you need to in, both of those national identities need to be represented in the state. There are binational countries. C Canada is a binational country, for instance. Belgium is binational. So you could you would you could call the country Israel Palestine in Hebrew and Palestine Israel in Arabic, for instance, right? As a way of representing both. You would need to, I think, recognize that both Hebrew and Arabic would be national languages taught in all schools, but in primarily Jewish areas, Hebrew would be the language of main instruction, and in primarily Palestinian areas, Arabic would be the language of main instruction. Um, in terms of Palestinian refugee return, this is something I've written about, there are actually very few original Palestinian homes that are left, um, so you're not really talking talking for the most part about Palestinians reclaiming homes. You're talking about Palestinians being able to move back inside to near the areas in which they lived before. And, and, and one of the funny things about Israel is that Israel actually has a lot of experience in, in, in incorporating large populations that, that come um, uh, within a very short time. It had to do that in the early 1950s when a lot of people came, Jewish populations came from the Middle East. It had to do it again in the early 90s when a lot of Jews came from the former Soviet Union. And what Israel did then was basically it gave developers an incentive to quickly build a lot of housing in near urban areas where there were jobs, and then it gave people a kind of basket of uh, vouchers to, to buy those, to rent those apartments, and also other subsidies so they could basically start a life, right? This is what Israel's actually been pretty successful in doing this with Jewish populations. It's just not been willing to contemplate doing it with a Palestinian population. In terms of immigration policy, so Israel's immigration policy now is that any Jew around the world can fly to Ben Gurion Airport and get citizenship on day one, and it's almost impossible to get citizenship in Israel if you're not Jewish, if you come from outside. And, that, and that's true for also for Palestinians. So if you're a Palestinian who was born in Israel and then who was expelled, you can't return and get citizenship. Even if you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel who marries a Palestinian who's outside of Israel, let's say the West Bank or Gaza, you can't bring them and let them get citizenship. So the policy that I would have would be the Palestinians should have the right to return those Palestinians who were expelled and their and their children and grandchildren, and that Israel's immigration policy should be that um, any Jew or any Palestinian beyond that who was in danger in the country in which they lived should be allowed to go to this country and get citizenship immediately. So it should be a refuge for Jews who are in distress and for Palestinians in distress, right? But it doesn't need to be, in my view, a country in which any Jew can go from New York and become a citizen on day one. For the rest of us, we can, we can have it go through a normal emigration process because Israel doesn't, is not a refuge for us in terms of us being endangered somewhere else. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, so my question revolves around um, religion and yeah. um, what's happening in Palestine and Israel. Mm. So there's this like notion going around that like I feel like it's mostly for people who like actually never mind. Um, a lot of people call this a religious war mm. especially because like they think that it's like Jews versus Muslims yeah. but again like the population in Palestine is extremely extremely diverse like there's Christians living there there's Muslims there's Jews there's atheists. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I agree. I don't think it's there are elements of religion in the conflict, but I think it's not it's not primarily a, a religious conflict. It's primarily uh, a national conflict between two nations that 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 both um, uh, um, that are, that have been struggling with one another since the emergence of the Zionist movement uh, um, in the in the late 18 in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And as you said, some of the most prominent Palestinian Christian leaders, and indeed some of the most radical Palestinian leaders, have actually been Christian. So for instance, we think about Hamas as an Islamist organization. But if you think about the uh, Palestinian armed attacks of the 1970s um, um, so, uh, against airline hijackers, uh, uh, a massacre in a place called Ma'alot in Israel, the Munich Olympics, some of those were actually carried out by leftist communist Palestinian factions, for instance, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which was the, one of the most hardline Palestinian groups. Its leader, George Habash was a Christian. Um, so 
Um, and, and, and Palestinians, it's not like Palestinian Christians have a different set of rights than Palestinian Muslims. If you're Palestinian in the West Bank, you live under military law whether you're, Pal whether you're Christian or Muslim. Um, so yes, I think it's, it's a mistake to see it primarily as a religious conflict. Thank you. Sure. Hi, um, my question is also based on sort of the, the religious aspect of this conflict. Um, when I, I, I've taken a look at the Talmud myself a couple of times, um, looking at Tractate Soferim Rule 10, where there is not only an equating of physicians and butchers with each other, mm -hmm. referring to Gentiles, mm -hmm. they're also saying that there is a partnership between them and Amalek, mm -hmm. the same Amalekites that Benjamin Netanyahu has said that he's mm -hmm. fighting against. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question would be, how much do you think that Talmudic verses like these aid and assist Zionistic thought in relation to this conflict? So the Talmud is a, is a vast, vast compilation of rabbinic teachings over many, many, many hundreds of years. Right. And like any, as in any large monotheistic religion, you will find many different voices, right? Some of those voices speak about the importance of compassion and the importance of human dignity and treatment of all people. Some of them speak in very exclusionary terms about the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in hostile terms about Gentiles. Remember, that may have been coming out of the environment that the rabbis who were comp compiling the Talmud were experiencing themselves in Babylonia, the, the dominant Talmud that people study is the Babylonian Talmud, right. which was com compiled in Babylonia. But it's, it's not, I think, a good idea to cherry pick particular verses from the Talmud any more than it would be a good idea to do so vis-a-vis -vis the Bible or the Quran, because again, these are vast texts that speak in many, many different voices, and also because mm -hmm. Jews have a tradition of interpretation. So Jews are not, unlike Protestants, Jews don't go simply to the text and, and, and read it on its own. They read it with commentaries. The Talmud is particularly read with a series of, of medieval commentaries that help us understand, and, and then more modern commentaries, that help us understand what the Talmud means. So unless one <laughs> understands that interpretive tradition, one is likely not to necessarily understand the way Jews interpret a particular so let me talk about for Amalek, for instance, right? Yes. So um, the Amalekites are these people who are, uh, uh, they show up in the book of Exodus. They show up again later in the, in the Torah. And the, and the command is they fight against the children of Israel after they leave Egypt. And the command is to blot out and exterminate the um, Amalekites, right? But right. What the, and then the, the descendants of the Amalekites emerge again um, uh, um, in the book of Samuel, and then again, again in the book of Esther. But mm -hmm. what the what the rabbis do? I, what what the rabbis do is they say that it, um, um, that we don't know who the Amalekites are anymore. That we can't point to any group of people and say these are the Amalekites. So essentially, they this is a, it is a very troubling idea that there's a population that you would exterminate. But the rabbis essentially the rabbis the, the rabbinic tradition defangs it by saying, we don't know who the Malachites are, so you're not allowed to point to any group of people and say they are Amalekites. And that's actually why what Benjamin Netanyahu did was so was not only wrong and dangerous, but it was actually a revolt against rabbinic Judaism, right? Because rabbinic Judaism is pretty clear that we cannot say we know who the Amalekites are. So when Netanyahu says the Amalekites are Hamas, or the Amalekites are the people of Gaza, or as he used to say, that they are the people, you know, the Iranian regime. This is actually a, a violation of rabbinic Judaism itself, um, and um, and and a bastardization, I think, of our tradition. Okay, thank you. Sure. My bar mitzvah per, uh, um, portion was Amalek. Ah, <laughs> Sixty-two <okay>. years ago. <laughs> Amen to what you just said, mm. um, Professor Beinart. Uh, I've wanted to meet you for a long, long time. My name is Leonard Lehrman. I'm a uh, life member, uh, subscriber to Jewish Currents since 1987. Uh -huh. And um, right. I want you to talk about something that Professor Manis brought up, which is the generation divide uh -huh. between your generation, well, the younger than you, yeah. who, who, who want to see democracy in Israel uh -huh. and don't care if it's a Jewish state, uh -huh. and 
my generation mm -hmm. that want to see, a, would like to see democracy, yeah. but don't want to give up yeah. a Jewish state. Yeah. I yeah. would like you to address that, and I would also commend you for being open to those that disagree with you. I do disagree with you on some things, not everything. I think you're very informed and very articulate. I wish that you would do some, I, I plead with you that you will speak to the other editors of Jewish Currents mm. who have cut me off, mm. blocked me, because I talked to, tr tried to talk to them about the importance of liberal Zionism, okay. the importance of going to a, a rally uh, honoring the memory of Yitzhak Rabin, mm. which one of your editors, Mari mm. Cohen, dissuaded AOC from going. I thought that was horrendous. That well, we, we need a dialogue and peace. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, okay. Can I, I come in? I want to sneak into his question, if I sure. may. Because okay. I'm looking at the clock. Okay, so well, this will be maybe the... Let's see how maybe. fast I am. Yeah, see question. how fast you are. Now. Because I think the question that's being raised about the generations mm you know, at this point cannot be separated from U.S. policy, which mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. elephant in the room mm -hmm. um, that we haven't touched on. Yeah. And that, you know, I think, so I, I want to just bring the narrowest piece of that and then also talk about what that means for the generations. Yeah. Right, that as of where we are right now, yeah. <laughs> that the Biden administration on the one hand is asking the Israeli government you know, not to attack Rafa, not to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for a ceasefire, that's yeah. what they're saying that yeah. right this minute, at the same time as they're giving billions of dollars in yeah. weapons yeah. to Israel. That yeah. that was in the appropriations bill that just passed. Yeah. It's in the supplemental that they want to have. Yeah. And so, you know, in terms of the generations here in the United States, right. that's really connected to U.S. policy. I, I'm really curious if you see any positive way out of the situation that exists right now. Well, so there's a, there's a, there, I feel like there's a, there's a part of that about U.S. policy and there's a part of that about generational divide, so um, I'll try to talk about both, and if I'm going on too long, just tell me. We have till 4.05. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so let me start with U.S. policy. I, I think that Joe Biden <laughs> came into office really determined not to have a public fight with Israel um, uh, um, because he... For he saw that Obama had had these public fights with Netanyahu at the beginning of his presidency over a settlement freeze and over the, a speech that Obama gave calling for a Palestinian state on the 67 lines. And he saw that basically it had been a huge pain in the ass for Obama because basically Netanyahu had pushed back. The Democrats in Congress hadn't really stood beside Obama. And Obama had kind of lost those fights. And, 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 and Biden knew that there would be huge political cost to pay for fighting with Netanyahu. And also Biden wanted to focus on what he thought of as bigger and more important things like China and Russia. He, he wanted to basically just manage this, keep it quiet, and basically focus on other things, which he was tr doing, which basically largely meant it let Israel do what it wants, ask the Israels to try to kind of keep things quiet, but basically let Israel do what it wants. And that was kind of seemed like they thought it was working until October 7th. Then October 7th, he has a big problem. Um, and so the strategy that he had was to, to go to Israel to show them as much support as possible, to empathize them with as much as possible, to hug Netanyahu close, and to hope that that would give him some leverage so they could steer what Israel was going to do a little bit. Um, but it hasn't worked, because actually Netanyahu doesn't really have an incentive to listen to the Biden administration. The Biden administration is worried because they, are, they know that a lot of their democratic base is alienated by what Israel's doing. They also, and they're, and they're worried that they'll be even more alienated. Israel's kind of cleared out most of the Gaza Strip except for this area of Ra called Rafa right up against Egypt where a huge number of people have gone now because basically they've been forced out of their homes. They're basically living in horrifying conditions, basically literally on the street, um, dying of starvation and of, of disease, and is, but there are are Hamas battalions that are in that population. Israel says four. Uh, and so Israel wants, says we need to finish the job and go in and clear out. The Biden administration is saying, first of all, it's going to be a huge, huge humanitarian catastrophe. And secondly, that even if you go in there, you're not really going to have solved your problem because Hamas will reconstitute itself. And even if it's not Hamas, something else will emerge because you're not dealing with the underlying problem. Um, so that, and they, so they've been trying to kind of hope and ask nicely and be passive aggressive kind of leaks to the media saying we're really not happy we're really not happy but Netanyahu doesn't have an incentive to listen to them because first of all if Netanyahu stops the war then Israel probably goes to elections which Netanyahu would lose so it's not his, his interest for the war to end and secondly 
the Israeli population, the Jewish Israeli population, is behind the war, most of them. Israel has, although Israelis have soured on Netanyahu, they've moved to the right, even further to the right politically. They support the war. So Netanyahu, it's, a, it's not a, for, Netan, for Netanyahu to give Biden the middle finger is good politically for him. He doesn't have any incentive to basically listen to, 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 to Biden. The, the only card that Biden can play is the one that he's been super reluctant to play, which is to basically say, we're not going to give you the weapons to do this. Or, and to say, we're not going to protect you in international institutions like the UN or the International Criminal Court. So you want to do it? OK. We can't stop you from doing it. But we're not going to give you the weapons, and we're not going to protect you from the consequences. Now, that would be a very serious move. The United States has not conditioned military aid against Israel since the early 1990s, even though under law we are supposed to. Because there's something called the Leahy Law, which says that we're not allowed to give military, we're not allowed to give weapons to any country that ha uh, to the unit of any m foreign military that is found to be committing human rights abuses. But we don't even track the data to know whether there are units of the Israeli military that committed human rights abuses. So I think Biden needs to take that step. We can't be sure what the consequences it would be in Israel, but it w I think it would send an important message to Americans, right, um, about where we stand morally. And also it would, I think, make some Israelis think twice, right? Because it's one thing to basically defy, you know, um, it's one thing to defy America when you know America is basically going to keep the, money, the weapons flowing anyway. It's another thing to defy Americans if America cuts off the weapons, and especially if America doesn't give you international impunity. It's not inconceivable that if America were to change its stand, that there could be international investigations that would get to the place where Israeli military officials would have to worry about whether they could even travel to certain countries in Europe because they might be arrested. Um, as vi for, for having violated uh, international law and committed war crimes. So this would change Israel's calculus. That's what I would hope Biden would do. On the, on the, on the question of Amer the generational divide among American Jews, um, I think younger and older American Jews have had different life experiences. So young, older American Jews are more likely to have come of age at a time when they saw Israel as um, a kind of um, as a country that was embattled and on the verge of destruction. For instance, they might have remembered the 1967 war, which many American Jews felt that Israel was on the verge of destruction, and, and when it triumphed was a moment of tremendous enthusiasm for Israel. Um, uh, and, and whereas younger American Jews are more likely <coughs> to have seen Israel as a kind of regional superpower occupying the Palestinians. They are likely to not have remember any Israeli prime minister besides Benjamin Netanyahu. So they've only known an Israeli prime minister who doesn't support a Palestinian state, who seems to want to occupy the Palestinians forever, and an Israeli politician who frankly reminds them a lot of the Republicans in America that they don't like, uh, who supported the Iraq war, who seems friendly with, the, you know, with Donald Trump and these guys. And so that has led American Jews to move in a different direction. I also think American Jews have been influenced by the greater prominence of Palestinian voices who have more prominence today, especially on college campuses, than they do. And often it's depicted as if, like, the Palest you know, the, the Jewish students are all just, like, kind of, that the, the Jewish students and the Palestinian students are always at odds with one another. But I actually think often there's a lot of learning that takes place, more than happened a generation ago, where, where Jewish students meet Palestinian students and they learn all about their experience. And they learn that their experience of what it means to live in Israel is radically different than the experience, than the things that they were taught about what it's like for Jewish people to live in Israel. And so I think, and, and I think the last point is that American Jews are in this weird position because American Jews are fundamentally opposed to the idea of America being a white Christian supremacist state. We fundamentally believe in the principle of equality under the law. We're against ethno-nationalism. And yet, the American Jewish institutions and many older American Jews in Israel support a form of ethno-nationalism. They support a form of group supremacy by one ethno-religious group, even though they oppose that principle in the United States. And I think more young American Jews, especially in the age of Donald Trump, essentially see that as a kind of a contradiction and want the same principles in Israel-Palestine that they want in the United States. And they notice that when people talk about maintaining Israel's demographic majority in Israel, and they look around and like think, who talks in those terms in the United States about maintaining our demographic majority? They notice that it's people like Tucker Carlson, right? And so that's not the political, that's not the politics that they want to, they, they believe in. Now again, it's, that's not to say that all young American Jews by any means 
support my view of one equal state. Many, many don't. Um, uh, but I think what you find is there's a real divide among younger American Jews. So while among older American Jews, there's a pretty strong, what you could call pro-Israel or Zionist consensus, among young American Jews, it's much more divided. Um, and I think there's a real debate that will play out among younger American Jews in the years to come. Yeah, it has to be really quick because they're all going to start leaving in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But yeah, it has to be quick. They, right. are, they are going to they are going to get up and leave in like two minutes. <laughs> okay. Because they ha they have other classes to get to. So yeah. All right. Well, let us assume for the moment that a Jewish state yeah. run by Jews has some worth, some validity. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could argue that if that had been the case in the 30s and the 40s, the worst aspects of the Holocaust might have been avoided. Mm -hmm. Let us uh, assume that had that been the case in the 19th century, the oh. worst aspects of some Russian pogroms mm -hmm. uh, might have been avoided. Oh, and in parenthesis, uh, in 1945, uh, Germans who lived east uh, of the oder Nisa line were you know, forced back into Germany and right. gave up uh, right. whatever their wealth right. was in those areas. All right, so fast forward to the near future, and uh, in Israel, uh, the right of absolute return mm. is, um, uh, y you know, be becomes realized, yeah. right? Uh, at the, at just, I'm, I'm trying to make my point. Okay, so that being the case, um, Palestinians have larger families than Jews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that being the case, at some point after that, mm -hmm. perhaps the population of Palestinians becomes greater than the population of Jews mm -hmm. in what was yeah. the Jewish state yeah. run by Jews. Yeah. Then what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Palestinian population is larger now. There's already a Palestinian majority between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. It's just that most of those Palestinians can't vote. So the question seems so to me. They can vote. Now they can vote with the right of return. That's right. No, no, I know they can't vote now. My point is to say people say there would be a Palestinian majority. There's already a Palestinian majority. It's just that most of the Palestinians can't vote, so they can't express themselves politically. My argument is that actually Israeli Jews are safer living alongside Palestinians who have basic human rights than Palestinians who don't have basic human rights. I think you're right, and I'll stop because then we're going to leave. I think you're right that it's true. If, an, if a Jewish state had existed, then it could have been a place that could, that with its, could have saved more uh, Jews from Europe coming. It's also the case that the rest of the world didn't open their doors, and in fact didn't even open their doors after World War II uh, uh, to, to Jews in Europe, which is why they didn't have a place to go. The vast, as you know, the vast majority of Eastern European Jews who were fleeing pogroms in the late 19th and early 20th century didn't go to Palestine, even though they had some access to go to Palestine. They went to the United States and other places in the New World. Who did not let them in in the 40s, in the early 40s. Yes, the U.S. shut its doors in 1921 and never opened them again until, 19, right. until after World Correct. War II. Right. Yeah. Thank you for thanking both of our panelists. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.